Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my great um, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker this morning, Professor Imordino Yen. Um, so, uh, so before she pulls out her talk, I will give you a very brief introduction of her background. Um, because uh, if I'm going, I'm going to be very selective. Because if I'm going to read through uh, all her great achievements to you, I will use up all the uh, all the talk time. But um, so, Professor Imordino Yen uh, has received background or training in very interdisciplinary uh, disciplines. Uh, she attended prestigious universities uh, from college. Um, she majors in uh, French studies while taking course, courses in psychology, biology, anthropology, physics, French, Swahili, and Russian. So from the extended list of her coursework, you can already expect that she has very wide interest and can um, be a really interdisciplinary expert, uh, provides the background for her later work. Um, I believe that she has been a teacher in high school for a couple of years before she joins the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education. Uh, through her wonderful talks online, we know that she has like ex um, experience in the education uh, field, uh, which motivates her interest in knowing the mechanisms uh, behaviorally and in the, uh, in the brain, how, uh, how learning should be situated um, in the context of culture while considering the emotion or uh, all aspects of de de developments in adolescence. And then uh, after uh, receiving her PhD from Harvard, she moves on to USC, University of Southern California to be the postdoctoral researcher fellow under the mentorship of the famous uh, Dr. DiMaggio, um, who, uh, whose books have been translated into Mandarin. So some of our audience may have read those. Um, and from there, she continues to uh, have uh, significant contributions to the field uh, of educational neuroscience. I will say that uh, currently, Professor Imodino Yen is um, the USC faculty in psychology as well as in uh, um, education. And she's also the founding director of USC Center for Ethetic Neuroscience Development, Learning and Education, which is a very important trend uh, that should be emphasized even more. Uh, among the numerous awards, grants that uh, Dr. Imordino Yen has received, uh, I would like to uh, mentioned a couple of very um, uh, special uh, experience of her uh, that she has been, uh, in addition to great contribution in academia, she has very uh, important um, impact to policy making. So she has done the briefing um, in the United States Congress um, to, to really bring academia work to real life which uh, I really admire. Um, so without further ado, I, I, I want to say more, but it's, there's just too much to say. And I'm sure she has a lot to share with all of you. So let me give the platform to um, Dr. Imordino Yen, and uh, we'll have more time for discussion later on. So please. Thank you. That's a very kind introduction. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to jump right in to the, um, to the content of the talk. Um, so uh, what we've been studying is really um, the ways in which young people and their teachers build meaning together. Um, and basically in order to start to understand what counts as the most meaningful opportunities for young people in school, what actually grows them over time, what kinds of work produce abilities to think over time that situate them well to be productive and ethical members of society and happy people. 
Um, and so much of the traditional way that we have designed school, the accountability measures for being successful at school, the ways in which people get accepted to school, the kinds of roles that teachers and students are expected to play in school are very prescribed traditionally. And those prescribed roles, we think, um, may not be optimal for the ways that adolescents' brains actually learn. And they also may not be optimal in supporting the whole growth and development of the person, which of course is the ultimate aim of education in the end. You can always learn some skills or some special technical knowledge if you need it as you go forward, but developing into an ethical citizen who engages with other people effectively, who's productive, who's who's uh, who's able to really manage themselves in society and contribute, that is an extremely important aim of education. And much of our education has treated that as if it's separate from your ability to do math or to think about art or history or politics, or whatever it is you're learning in school. And what our brain data suggest now is that those dimensions of learning that are social, that are emotional, uh, that rely on culture and ways of experiencing the world are actually not handled by separate brain systems from the systems that do cognition in the traditional sense of IQ or of solving problems. In fact, we show, for example, and work with a colleague of mine, a, st a student who worked in my lab, Solange de Nervo, for example, that um, when children are solving math problems in school, we're seeing that their response to errors in the brain is driving their learning as they engage. And that learning is being driven, therefore, by affective regions in the brain, regions in the brain that feel your guts and your viscera that are associated with emotion and pain and pleasure and appetitive drives, right? Um, so to think that you have kind of math ability separate from the way you feel in that space and the way in which you sense your own body and self in that space is really incorrect. And yet much of the way that we had designed our educational system and much of the way that we train teachers um, for their important work uh, reflects that misunderstanding. So I'm going to start uh, with a painting by a colleague of mine named Margaret Lazari, who uh, was the chair of the fine arts department at the University of Southern California, where I am. And um, we did this little project together where I gave her some of our neuroimaging data. Basically, we took pictures of one brave person's brain in our MRI scanner um, and uh, basically took off the outside of the, of the brain all of the little cells, the neurons that are doing the firing around the outside of the cortex. Um, we, we took those off the picture, right? Not off the person, don't, don't worry. Um, and then uh, uh, what we gave her was all of the white matter fiber tracts that are underneath that cortex um, that are basically the microscopic little tubes of salt water that are synapsing onto sometimes hundreds of thousands of other little cells and tubes of, of water, right? In order to move electricity and chemicals around the space of the head. And in fact, all the way down into the body to the ends of the fingers and toes and back up again that these these networks make up the sort of coherent connectivity between your different parts of your brain and your brain and your uh, face and your body uh, so that you can actually be one whole organism in space and time. And what I've loved about, uh, about this painting by, by Margaret Lazari is that she's painted that, that interconnectivity of those networks of one person's brain, not sort of you know, in a bucket in the corner where we can all put on our science glasses and study it. But in, instead she's painted it kind of semi-translucent, sloshing back and forth in, this, in, in a world of other organisms that's holding it up and warming it from the top with the yellow sunlight and tickling the bottom with the little weeds and little red fish swimming by to represent the spontaneity of our creative ideas. And that is how we are coming to really understand the brain and its functioning. We, we cannot understand the brain if we think of it as being encapsulated in one person's skull 
and just sort of uh, stuck there doing its work in isolation with input coming in and output going out. That's actually not how the brain works at all. In fact, the way in which we interrelate with one another, the social and cultural settings in which we ensconce ourselves, in which we construct sort of norms and behaviors and relationships together with other people, together with the artifacts that we build to um, support our modern lifestyle, all of that is supporting and shaping the way that the brain is growing itself and functioning over time. Um, and so it's extremely important that our young people are supported in not just what they know how to do, but more importantly, also in how they feel as they are learning, who they're learning with, the relationships that they have with their teachers, with their community, with their peers, those kinds of relational emotions, the feelings that you have being together in that space are actually shaping the development of the brain over time. And this has real implications for the ability of the person to think uh, as they are moving forward in their life. So we really think it's very important to kind of reframe the discussion in education to focus much more on the experience of the person thinking. What does it feel like to think about these problems? How does the process of thinking about these problems in this space, in this context, shape my dispositions toward myself, toward the future, toward engaging with the information? Those kinds of deeply subjective experiential dimensions of the learning process turn out to be absolutely fundamental to the way the brain grows itself. So, you know, one way you can think about this, <coughs> excuse me, is in terms of, you know, the genetics that we bring to the situation. There's a lot of work right now in the world, some of it uh, quite problematic, um, about you know correlations between genetic profiles and people's abilities to do schoolwork. And so the thing is, what we're beginning to understand is that those, pro those correlations exist because of the way, largely because of the way people are treated in the learning space, because of the opportunities they've had. Why? Because our genes do not have all the information they need to be able to grow your brain. Instead, our genes are dependent on opportunities to engage in social and cultural learning and relationships as a source of information for how to grow yourself. So if you think about, for example, the Human Genome Project, which I'm sure you've heard about, um, which was a major international effort to map for the first time all of the genes that went into one human being. Um, and so it was an incredible uh, scientific collaboration internationally to be able to do this. And when you read the first nature paper that was, uh, that was uh, written at the start of that amazingly uh, complex project, it basically says, we think that by mapping the entire human genome for the first time, we will gain nuanced insights into the nature of development, individual variation, uh, health and disease, aging, right? All of these very fundamental uh, processes that we don't really understand. And the second nature paper from that project basically says, we're done already. It turns out that human beings had far fewer genes than anyone had expected. We have about as many genes as a goldfish, and we have far fewer genes actually than a, a rice plant, like a plant that grows in the mud and grows rice grains to eat, right? I mean, rice plants are amazing. They grow little seeds, they photosynthesize, they, you know, they, they, they do all kinds of amazing uh, physiological things but they don't create calculus. They don't have religion or art or music. They don't have the kinds of human cultural activities that our mind makes possible. And what we've really come to realize that was cemented by that project 
is that the nature of our human intelligence is not that evolutionarily our genes have specified more and more specifically how to build a brain that can do all the complex things that humans do. Instead, what has happened across evolution appears to be a kind of relaxing of the constraints on our genetics so that our genes have become less numerous, less uh, uh, direct at specifying our, our development and our brain development in particular, and more outsourced onto the cultural world. So what this basically means is that human babies come to the world with a kind of, uh, with a set of like contingency plans, plans that basically say, if you live in a world that feels like this, with people treating you like that, with opportunities to think about these things, grow your brain like this and like this and like this so that you'll be able to adapt well to that situation. If you land yourself in a different kind of situation where people treat you a different way, where there are different things that you need to be thinking about in order to, in order to do well in that setting, where the relationships are shaped differently, grow your brain differently in order to be able to accommodate to that kind of setting. So our brain development itself turns out to be deeply, uh, deeply uh, reliant on the cultural and social world in which we live. This means that the relationships that young people experience, I mean, this is true throughout the lifespan, it's, it's actually very true in middle adulthood and, and especially so in elderly adults also, we see this very clearly, where social relationships, feeling useful, feeling like you're part of, well, that you have an important role to play in the social world is associated with purpose and longevity and with brain health, right? Uh, and physical health. Our health is in part shaped by the way in which we emotionally feel in the social space in which we live and think. And this is no different in math class, right? Than it is in any other space, like at home with your family. Our brains are engaging in ways that are choosing the things that are valued, that we care about, that the people around us engage in, and we engage with them in these sort of acculturated, co-constructed ways. And in so doing, we teach our brain how to grow. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a little bit about how this happens, we think. Some of our latest work on adolescent brain development uh, and relating adolescents' development of their brain into the future, actually. We can predict what's gonna happen in an adolescent's brain in the next two years based on the way in which they think when we show them complex, interesting stories about other teenagers around the world and ask them, what do you think about this? How does this story make you feel? And the ways that kids answer that, how curious they are, how much they stop to think about how this might relate to their own self or to how the world could work. You know, bigger lessons than just, I need to know this and this and this and respond in these ways. Those bigger lessons that kids are looking for and trying to extract and make meaning out of turn out to actually activate brain networks in a way that we think is coordinating their connections in those white fiber tracks that are in the painting over time so that you're actually growing their brain by thinking about complex issues they care about. And in turn, that brain growth is predicting how happy they are and how productive and successful and good in school they are when they're in their young adult years. So it's something that actually really seems to matter for kids how they think, not just what they know. And how you think is, is deeply dependent on the how people around you think and interrelate with you and the ways in which school is structured and organized to support you having certain kinds of processes and goals in mind as compared to just remembering and being able to regurgitate back quickly, those kinds of things which our data suggests are not as effective at growing the brain over time. So I'm gonna show you a short video clip of our lab um, 
from our, that was done in our lab from a, a United States t television show uh, to science show where um, they look at all kinds of interesting scientific phenomena. And, and this particular show was about um, the school of the future. Like, what are we learning about young people's development that might change the way we think about school? Um, and I'm showing it because it has a little clip that just gives you a kind of intuitive sense of how we collect the brain imaging data and the data about how kids are talking about their meaning, what they're thinking and feeling like, and, um, and how that corresponds to the results that I'm about to show you after the video. So I'm just gonna play a short video. Uh, you should hear sound when it plays. Can you hear it? Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Mary Helen. Nice to meet you. Since her days as a teacher, University of Southern California neuroscientist Mary Helen Imordino Yang has been interested in knowing how emotions factor into learning. I quickly realized that there was very, very little known about the kind of stuff that we really care about in education, like how people become inspired. How do we become interested in things? How do we build curiosity? And how can we support that process? <laughs> In trying to identify which parts of the brain are involved in the deepest and most meaningful learning, Imordino Yang works with teens from troubled neighborhoods. We're gonna be watching stories. We really wanna know what you think, so there's no right or wrong answers. These are kids who see a lot of crime, they see a lot of dangerous things, they see a lot of poverty. And we wanted to understand how do they make meaning of that world around them. This first one is a story about a girl who lives in Savat, Pakistan. And the city was being taken over and basically run by a group called the Taliban. Um, so I want you to watch her when she was 12 years old. First, she gets them emotionally engaged in a topic by showing them videos about people struggling to overcome adversity. And I want to become, become a doctor. <laughs> So how does her story make you feel? Um, this story makes me feel upset how she wants to be a doctor and continue on with her education, but it makes her sad that knowing her journey would be very difficult. For adolescents, these types of stories can trigger moments of deep reflection. They come back from those kind of reflective moments with this heightened appreciation of the meaning of the story and what it applies to in their own life and what it means for the nature of the world more broadly. And it's crazy how it's that powerful. Whereas we've known that for a long time in education, the neural data are giving us new insights into the mechanics of that process. And over here. To find out which brain regions are harnessed during reflective emotion, Imordino Yang monitors the students' brain activity as they re-watch the emotional videos in an fMRI scan. Hi, Estella, how you doing in there? Good. So we're looking at the movement of the blood flow in her brain as she's watching the stories, and where in her brain is becoming more and less active as she's experiencing these emotions. She found that the reflective thinking caused by these emotional videos triggers widespread activity throughout the brain. The most high-level brain states that people experience in the scanner don't just activate high-level systems. They also activate lower-level structures of the brain that are involved in regulating and monitoring your consciousness and your survival. Imordino Yang believes that the reason why learning and emotion seem so intimately connected is because complex emotion, like admiration, can activate basic brain functions, like those regulating breathing and heart rate. We think that the reason that humans' values and belief systems and ideals are such powerful motivators is literally that they're hooking themselves into biomechanical machinery that has evolved to keep us alive over time. So emotions are a critical piece of learning always. Meaningful learning, learning that really matters to you, that changes who you are and that endures over time, always has an emotional component. 
So I would draw upon any of these. Like... Her research shows that engaging students on an emotional level makes for more powerful learning experiences. So the idea there, you see like a young person comes, the kids who were featured in that particular study are from uh, poor uh, neighborhoods in Los Angeles. They're either from East Asia, from Asia, China, Taiwan, uh, uh, those regions, but they've immigrated to the US uh, or they're from uh, South and Central America and they've immigrated to the US in that particular experiment. Um, but what we basically show is that we have automatic emotional reactions to things. You know, if, if somebody frightens you or you see a snake or something, right, automatically your heart starts pounding, you stop digesting your lunch, the blood shunts to your muscles and away from your uh, guts and viscera, and, and you get ready to run or fight or whatever it is you're going to do, right? Automatically, when your little baby looks at you and smiles, right? If you're engaged with them, you can't help but feel warm and good and you laugh and smile back. Those kinds of emotional reactions are triggered and organized by social relationships much of the time. But what I'm going to argue is that we have to learn how to interpret the emotions we're feeling about complex and difficult information like what we learn in school so that we can feel emotional about it. We can feel interested in it. We can feel like it's powerful, like it's important. And we can feel really satisfied and happy when we understand. That kind of curiosity and engagement, I would argue, has to be learned by our engagement with the world. And education's job is to introduce young people to a world that's so full of interesting things to understand that they become disposed over time to curiously engage with these things. And they take the natural curiosity they come with as an infant and they start applying it to all kinds of difficult ideas like in math or in science or in literature or the arts whatever it is that they like to do, they have co-opted those basic proclivities to engage, to learn, to try, to grapple with stuff. And they have re-applied uh, those emotions that they have for, for engaging with the world and with other people in order to be interested in things. Um, and so when we think about that as the aim of education, we, it really reshapes how we think about presenting information and testing what counts as learning in a school context. In fact, it really kind of changes the whole purpose of school so that it no longer is to promote learning, right? Learning is not the end point of school. It's not the goal. Learning is the means. You learn in order to develop yourself, to develop your ability to think and feel in complex ways about all kinds of issues and things in the world. That is the goal of school. Learning is just the means to get there. And yet we stop, so often we stop and think the learning outcome is what we need to achieve. But that is only half, that's only halfway there. And when we stop there, we have really done a disservice to our kids because we have basically taught them to memorize and give us things back without helping them develop this ability to feel deeply interested or the satisfaction of understanding or being curious about complex problems. And it's that kind of thinking that actually produces productivity and mental health and uh, innovation in society over time. So emotions, this is my little nephew looking at my sister right via, uh, via a mirror. It's like emotions we show involved brain systems that are literally feeling and regulating your body, right? They're the same brain systems that tell you if you have a stomach ache or if your heart's pounding because you just ran up the stairs. Um, and for constructing consciousness as compared to coma, right? For being awake. And yet what we're actually doing when we're interested is co-opting those brain systems for your heart pounding and for your how your guts and your viscera feel and for feeling like you're excited and you just ran up the stairs and that it's you doing it, that you're awake doing it, you're co-opting all those things and repurposing them by, lear by learning to, uh, to feel that way in the context of 
some kind of academic content, math or uh, you know whatever it is you're doing. And this is why meaningful learning always involves emotion. If you think about it, you know, basically whatever you're having emotion about is what you're thinking about. And whatever you're thinking about, you could maybe learn about. So the question we need to ask ourselves about young people in school and teachers is what are they having emotion about? If the emotion is about fear of failure or excitement that they got an A plus, or uh, what's gonna happen next? Or what are people thinking? Why am I here? Like uh, all of that is what you are learning about. If you want them to learn about the content, their emotion needs to be in that content. And the question is, how do we redesign schools so that the content itself teaches people to engage deeply with it as compared to the endpoint? being the source of the emotion. What happened by the end? Did you do well? Did you not? Did you finish? Did you get an A? Did you get an F? That is not teaching you what the content is. You want to say, did I understand? Was it fascinating? Do I think now something new when I look up in the sky and see the planets than I did last week when I didn't know about them, right? Those emotions about that is helping you remember that. And that is what we need our schools to focus on and rebuild around. So if I take you for a moment into the brain and show you that this is actually not metaphor, it's actually, uh, it's actually real. Um, so this is a picture of one person's brain, you know, sliced through this way on the left side and then sliced this way and turned up so that the forehead is at the top and the back of the head is at the bottom of the image. Um, and so what, what, I've, what I'm about to show you is a statistical map of basically all the places in the brain where there was reliably more blood flowing when people told us that they were deeply interested in and engaged emotionally with and thought it was really powerful to think about the thing that we were asking them to think about as compared to when you know they were thinking about a story that didn't seem very important or interesting to them and they said you know I don't I'm kind of done thinking about that I don't find it very interesting at all and so we wanted to know where in the brain is there more activity when people find something deeply emotionally engaging. And what we find is that emotional engagement activates the same brain systems that literally keep you, you alive. Um, and so this is why it's so fundamental, right? Uh, you know, if we look at what we've got here on this map, over on the left right here, this is the brain stem. This is basically a stalk of densely packed little nuclei that are those little tails that you saw in the, in the painting at the beginning, right? But now arranged very tightly in these pathways that are basically sitting um, at the bottom of the brain in the middle of your head where they're very protected from injury between your brain and up here and your spinal cord down here. And they basically are the gateway between your brain and the world and your body, and then your body and face back into your brain again. So they are absolutely fundamental to survival. And what we see is that when people say they're deeply interested and emotionally engaged with what they're thinking about, we actually get very clear, consistent increases in blood flowing to regions in the brainstem that are involved up here. This is the mesencephalon, the midbrain. These regions up here are involved in consciousness. They keep you, if you have damage here, you get things like persistent vegetative state or coma. Uh, down here at the bottom of the field of view of the scanner in the, what we call the medulla, just above the spinal cord. What, if you get damage in the medulla right here, you die. Uh, we can't even keep you alive on life support short of defibrillating your heart with every beat. Basically what this shows is that when people are subjectively engaged with what they're thinking about, they are actually like more alive, right? They're actually becoming more awake, more uh, conscious as they engage with that information. And then over here we have uh, brain regions on the, either side of the cortex known as the anterior insula. These regions, anterior and middle insula, these regions are basically, have been known since the 1950s. There were 
a famous series of uh, neurosurgeries uh, by uh, a, a surgeon named Wilder Panfield, who was trying to cure people of severe epilepsy and seizures. Um, and he didn't have neuroimaging to be able to do what we do now for those kinds of surgeries, which is to locate exactly where people's language and other things are in their brain before you go and resect uh, to cure the, the place where the electrical storm is coming from in the brain, right? To make sure you're not gonna make them not be able to talk anymore or not remember their grandmother or something. Um, so, but, so what he had to do was he would put people to sleep, he would open up their head and then he'd wake them back up again and he'd poke around in the place where the seizure was coming from and ask the person, you know, what are you experiencing now? Um, and, you know, tell me about it, uh, talk to me. And so what he did was he basically, with many patients whose lives he was trying to save by uh, stopping their seizures, he would actually take detailed notes about what they said when you tickled in different parts of their brain. And so these were the first maps of the alive, awake human brain. And what he showed is that when you poke around in these regions here in the anterior insula, what happens is the person vomits or they get other kinds of gastromotoric you know, distress that I won't describe in polite company. Um, what he basically discovered is that these are the regions of the brain that are feeling what's happening in your guts that are giving you a sense of how your heart's beating, how your lunch is being digested, how well you're feeling inside of you. And what we showed is that when people are deeply emotionally engaged with thinking about something they think is really emotional and important and interesting, what's happening is they're actually leveraging the, the feeling of their own body. They're playing that out on the same regions that tell you if you have a stomachache, right? So our cultural and our social and our emotional and our cognitive ways of knowing and our bodily wellness are all tied up in one another. They're not actually culture over here and how you digest your lunch over here and how you think about math over there. As you're thinking about it, you're steering yourself by the feelings that you're conjuring that are simulated on what it would, how you would feel. And so it's actually part of making yourself mentally and emotionally well to think about interesting, engaging, important information. So how do we leverage that in the design of our school system? How do we teach kids what is important to feel emotional about? Are we teaching them that what we really need to have emotion about is what everybody else thinks and whether they got this grade or that grade or what's gonna happen next, or is what's really important to think about how incredibly powerful you know, uh, quadratic equations are for predicting exponential growth and how interesting and cool and useful that could be, right? Because if, like I said before, whatever the emotion is that you are, whatever the thing you are having emotion about, that is the thing you are thinking about. When you're thinking about it, you're playing it out on these systems that are also helping you to form memories and to actually become engaged with thinking it, about it over time, um, motivated to think over time. And so you know, we also have the anterior middle cingulate, which is a region of the brain that's basically like, you know, it kind of makes you, whoa, oh, whoops, I almost like stepped on something, right? But it's also the region of the brain that's involved in making you know when you're thirsty, if you drink a big glass of water, right? The water doesn't, you, you don't feel thirsty anymore if you drink the glass of water, but the water hasn't actually gotten to your bloodstream yet. It hasn't changed the chemistry of your blood. So how do you not feel thirsty if your blood is still too concentrated? Basically, there are calculations going on in your brain thinking, I've had this much water, I drank it this way, I felt like that going down my throat. I think I'm not thirsty anymore. I'm gonna turn it off and not feel thirsty anymore. Um, I'm, I'm satiated, I've had enough, right? these same regions that tell you I'm hungry, I want more, or no, I've had enough, like get away, right? Are the regions that are involved in doing math problems, for example, in the kids that we've been studying, right? These same regions that allow you to feel your own sense of self and the literal embodied sense are the ones that are being leveraged to learn with. So no wonder how we feel Thinking about things is so very important to, uh, to how we grow our brains and what we're capable of thinking about over time. So 
one other thing to know that's very interesting here is that emotional engagement isn't all the same. Only some kinds of thinking that's emotional actually activates these other systems that are right in the middle of the brain called the default mode system. They're in the middle and also some la characteristic lateral parietal regions. Um, and what we know about these is these were systems that were first described by, uh, by neuroscientists in like 2001 when um, these people, Marcus Rakel and his colleagues at Washington University, St. Louis realized people were using, neuroscientists were using um, MRI to study all kinds of tasks, right? We give you math problems, we see what happens in your brain. We give you a scary dog in your face, we see what happens in your brain. We, you know, we give you all these different things, language or pornography or whatever it is they were doing and then watching what happens in somebody's brain. What they thought is what would happen if we actually give somebody nothing to look at and just tell them, just relax, think about nothing, go fall asleep, just you know, let your mind water, don't really think about anything in particular. They thought they would discover the brain's default state. And what they actually paradoxically discovered is that when people were doing really hard problems and thinking about problems that were coming at them and they had to really try hard and work, these regions in the center of the brain were really quiet. There was very little firing going on in those neurons. But as soon as they took a break and were just allowed to just, just relax, don't think about anything, these incredible amounts of blood were coming and activating these regions. And it turns out that these regions, like this one over here underneath my cursor, is among the metabolically most expensive regions in the body. Uh, it basically uses as much blood, uh, oxygen, and glucose per unit time, per unit space, uh, when you're just relaxing as the same size uh, piece of muscle in your thigh uses in the middle of running a marathon, right? These parts of the brain use a huge amount of energy. How could it be that they are massively active when you're thinking about nothing? and become deactive when you have to watch and answer the question really quick and quick the next one and watch what's going on. And what we quickly came to realize over time is that these systems of the brain are not doing nothing. When you're not being asked to watch, pay attention, move your pencil on the paper, everybody's eyes on me, we're doing the directions, we have to do it. What happens is you start to think about what it all means. You start to wonder, you start to think, hmm, do I understand that? I wonder if it's like this and like that, or I wonder if that person likes me or if I, if, if, you right? You start telling all kinds of stories in your mind and thinking about things that you stop thinking about the moment you have to pay attention into the world, right? If you're running around in the middle of a soccer game, you can't be musing about the deep meaning of being able to play soccer, right? And the historical context of the game or something you need to actually be watching for the ball to hit you, right? And so what we think is going on in education context is that when we expect kids and teach kids, train kids to be watching, paying attention, moving their pencil, do the answer, what's the right answer? Ooh, I know it, next, next. What we're doing when we do that too much is actually teaching their brain not to activate these systems that are involved in a couple of really important things. First, the feeling of me, right? These are the systems that you become aware of your own internal self because you're not watching out here, you're just sitting with yourself. So they're deeply involved in well-being, in uh, being, um, being self-aware, uh, in being uh, uh, feeling good, right? They're also very involved in any kind of thinking that has to do with broader ideas that don't exist in things you can see right here, right now, but you have to figure out. They have to do with ideas that are stories that tell you about how the past is, is shaping what's happening now or what possible future things could happen next or the emotions or the ethics that undergird things that are happening. And it's not just notice, oh, she just said this to him, but wait a minute, that was mean and that hurt her feelings and that that's actually incorrect or whatever it is. All of that that you're building and that's a story in your mind that you can't directly see by paying attention into the world is happening in this network that is profoundly deactivated 
when you need to be watching into the world around you, paying attention and doing a task. And I think that has really important implications both for mental health and for the design of educational environments because so often we think erroneously that productivity and learning and using your time while in school is about doing tasks and showing the work. But whereas that's important, doing only that, focusing only on that is likely developing kids whose brains are focused so much into the world and on tasks that when they relax, there's nothing there. They feel empty. They have to have social media to, 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 to like entertain them and give them stuff. They, they, they just feel lonely. They don't know who they are. They don't have a sense of who they are and they don't have a deep drive to imagine things, to be curious, to think about what could happen next. What else could this mean? And all these bigger ethical kinds of implications <coughs> of the things they're thinking about. So I think I've written about this quite a lot. I can uh, point you to papers on this, but I think what we're learning is that um, education is, uh, is potentially undermining deep understanding and productivity, innovation and creativity, which is also happening in these networks where you're imagining things you can't see yet. That's what creativity is, right? Um, we're undermining those and together with that mental health and a sense of self and identity, which is also a story inside your mind. It's not a thing you see in the world. We're undermining those potentially by reinforcing for children that paying attention means paying attention only by accomplishing something here and now, and not just by deeply attending to effortfully thinking about ideas in your own mind and making sense out of those, regardless of what you look like to the outside world. It's a very big shift in the way we think about what productivity is. Um, and so I'm just going to take you back for a moment to the young woman at the beginning that you saw and give you a sense of what it looks like when young people are actually engaging these brain networks um, when they're making sense out of things. So you saw this young woman say, um, you know, the story makes me feel upset, how she wants to be a doctor. And get, right? This is basically factual learning. I, I watched the story. I know all the stuff about it. And it makes me feel sad for her. It's difficult. She's got to do this, but she, her journey is difficult, right? Like I've learned it. Thank you. I've learned it. You have to learn it to be able to have something to think about, right? But then she signals that she's moving into this other realm where she's kind of going down, closing her eyes and thinking about, wait, wait, it's really powerful. What's powerful? What's powerful? What does that mean to her? She goes on to say, it makes me think about my own journey in education, right? When you close down and you feel the inside of you, it makes you feel like you. And suddenly you start to learn from it. You start to connect the lesson to who you are and not just, oh, it's about this girl somewhere over there. It's actually about me and what I should do too, right? how I wanna to go to college and hopefully be a scientist someday. I'm happy to note that she is in college and becoming a scientist. Um, but even more, I guess what really hits me is how not everyone's able to get this chance to go forward with their life and get an education or do what they wanna do. I mean, it's not right, right? She starts to make these moral judgments based on what she's inferring that she's learned from the story, which is just about a girl who doesn't get to go to school because the Taliban doesn't believe in school for girls. And all of a sudden she goes, like, I didn't know that was the case. I have to think about, wait, now that I think about that, that's not right, that's morally wrong. And then she goes on and says, when I think more, right, it makes me feel upset. So she's talking about herself again and grief. And then she talks about other people who uh, live in certain parts of the world where they don't want people to learn and they're trying to hold them back. But, uh, and then she stops and she uses those pauses are also default, right? Her story inspires me to work harder so that I could prevent those things from happening maybe, right? So she takes it back and turns it into a lesson for herself. That can only happen if she's left free to stop and reflect with this slow pace. If you just say, what's the answer? Was it, was it Pakistan or was it, you know, Malaysia? And she has to know which one. That's not going to get you to, I need to work harder so I could prevent that from happening, right? She says, everyone everywhere should have the chance 
all human beings should be able to live free and choose their future. What she's basically saying is that there's a moral lesson that comes out of me having learned about this girl. That moral lesson is being built in those default mode systems that we may be interfering with when we have kids being one, two, three, all eyes on me, do the work, do the work, do the work, right? Uh, and when you're taking a break, play a video game, right? You're always like, feed me information, bing, bing. You know what I mean? Give me a grade. Did I do well? Did I not do well, right? All of that is potentially directly undermining the kind of development that comes from the kind of insights that uh, this young woman has shown us. And then I'm just gonna quickly say in the interest of time, so we have some time for questions, is that that kind of talk, the thinking about things in terms of their moral or broader implications, in terms of what they mean for me and what I should do, feeling inspired by it, all that default mode network activity actually is what allows us to predict that her brain is going to organize its growth more in those networks that you saw in the beginning floating in the ocean, right? Those networks are gonna become more coherently talking back and forth to each other, even just at rest in the next two years, regardless of what her IQ is, regardless of what her family's socioeconomic status is or what her parents' education level is, kids who are showing us that they're deeply curious to try to figure out what that means for them and the bigger story are growing their brains more. How do we build schooling that supports young people in becoming dispositionally engaged and curious with complex information? So I'm just gonna skip ahead and uh, basically show you that what's happening as kids are engaging with that kind of thinking is they're engaging the default mode, right? They're thinking about the big story and then they're in turn think, putting effort on it. And then with the executive network of the brain, and they're going back and forth. And as they do that, it's the salience, it's the emotional guts that you saw at the beginning that's actually saying, this matters, no, this matters, no, this matters, and helps them be thinking about those things. Kids need the freedom to try those ideas on and to try to make meaning. So just to sum up, thinking deeply about complex problems is basically telling emotional stories to yourself. You're thinking, wait, what does this math mean? Oh, fractions help me understand parts of things, which then I could use to understand, right? Those musings that happen in your mind are basically these emotional stories that are the forming of memories, the forming of a feeling of self, of how this information connects to who you are. Um, I'm just gonna show you really quickly an example of kids who we had at our lab um, to do a science camp where we were teaching, these are 10th to 12th graders, so they're like 16, 17, 18 years old, and they were from very, very poor backgrounds around the city. And we, we were able, we got a grant from the government to run this neuroscience camp where they could come for three weeks. And, and you know, basically we set them up to use the equipment and tell each other stories and try to play with it and figure out what, how does emotion work? How does it change my brain? And all these things that they were doing and, and try to figure out, we wanted them to kind of discover for themselves how emotion is so important to thinking and how emotions are grounded in relationships. Um, which we were helping them to form with one another. Um, and, uh, you know, with, from kids across different parts of the city who had very different ethnic backgrounds and things like that. So at the beginning of the camp, we sat them down in a little interview, each one separately, and asked them a bunch of questions. And one of the questions we asked was, what's a scientist to you? What does it mean to be a scientist? A scientist is, and the kids said things like, a scientist is good at science and math and needs to be able to answer all the questions, had the periodic table memorized, know everything about anything. It's very efficient. It's all about speed, right? A person who has worked in labs all day, taking info out of rats. A person with glasses that is skinny. They've been studying so hard that they don't have proper health and they're tired and weak looking. Uh, I always wonder why they wanna be in a science camp if that's what they think science makes you do. But anyway, a nerd who is antisocial and did not like having much fun. And after the camp, when all they did was do actual science with each other, what did they say? Same kids, 
someone who can walk into a subject blindfolded and explore and eventually become an expert, right? That's a growth mindset right there, okay? Constantly working with instruments, which may come with no set of instructions, but just persevering and sticking through it until it all works out. Almost completely opposite of what I used to think, right? Hello, metacognitive awareness of your own conceptual change, right? Not only do scientists not spend all day in a lab, but they're constantly engaged with other scientists and they collaborate their research. So it benefits them all. They're very engaged. They're very open. They care about what others think and their ideas. Any person who is curious. Okay, so it's not true that being curious is enough to be a scientist. You actually have to learn a lot of stuff to be a scientist. But boy, curious is way better a place to start from than a nerd who's antisocial and wears a white coat and memorizes everything. Why? because the first statements were about what do they look like? What do they do? The second statements are about default mode things. What kind of proclivity of mind do they bring to the world? What is their disposition toward learning? They have a curious disposition, irregardless of what kind of coat they wear and how much they already know about the periodic table, they want to engage with other people and in help other people to learn things with them. That is how you actually set up that orientation toward learning that will carry kids through a lifetime. Learning, in other words, shifts teachers and students from emotions that are about outcomes and results and grades and whatever that's at the end to emotions that are about the ideas themselves. What is the emotion teachers and students are having about? If it's about what happened by the grade or the end, that is what you're learning about. If it's about the actual ideas that you're trying to learn and understand, that is what you are learning about. So how do we reframe the education process to take people's attention off of the result and put it onto the idea? And then, Ironically, the results will follow. We're also doing work with teachers that shows that the most engaged teachers that students say are really helping them to learn are also engaging these regions when they're grading their student work, right? And when they are giving feedback to their students. This is not just a kid thing. This is actually what good teaching looks like also. It's not about results. It's about engaging with the kids and their ideas and trying to understand how are they thinking? How could I help them think about this in a way that's more sophisticated? How could I help them to develop themselves as scientists, as historians, as mathematicians, as, as dancers, whatever it is they're doing? So in conclusion, you can find more on our website or follow us on uh, Twitter where we are really bad about tweeting, but I do tweet once in a while whenever we have a paper or something you might like. And thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for the very inspirational talk. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, um, well, this is really uh, bringing many, like, well, I will say, like, very important ideas. But I would like to open the time to the audience. Um, you can type your questions in the text box, or if you want, you can uh, just, I think you can just open your microphone. Um, to raise your question, but um, while people are using their default mode to exactly <laughs> connect your talk with their own experience, um, let me pose, um, let me ask you. So I think it's super important to see that um, you mentioned the research, the study about uh, when people are doing math. Um, yeah, uh, the not just the abstract thinking or parietal lobe is being engaged, all other areas are relevant to emotion, or, mm -hmm. um, the important feelings of being alive uh, are somewhat activated. Um, but at the same time, not all kinds of emotions uh, are helpful to learning. For example, math, especially for this crowd, um, uh, who are interested in science and math teaching. Um, sometimes we encounter students who have uh, math anxiety, for yeah. example. So sometimes like getting 
So, so I guess it's about the amount or the balance, right? You want to engage emotion, but like too, maybe not too much or maybe not the wrong kind. Uh, I want to hear your thought about it, uh, particularly maybe using, say, math anxiety or people have a stereotypical feeling, which also involves their emotion regarding okay. certain um, topics or certain right. subjects such as science. Yeah, no, that's really important. So yeah, so the thing to remember is that there's always emotion present. People aren't alive if there's no emotion. Right? So the question is, what's the emotion about? So when people have learned through experience that math should make you feel anxious, what they're really doing is tipping that seat and going, ah, you know what I mean? Like, oh, what's out there, right? And they can't actually calm down and think about the ideas that will help them understand it. So it's the wrong, the emotion is about the wrong thing. If you ask them what their emotion about, it's not actually about the math, it's about failing at the math. It's about being scared of the math. It's not about I'm scared of the number two and the number three and they, they don't come together right. That's not what they're saying. They're saying, I'm gonna screw up, I'm gonna flunk, I'm gonna look stupid. That's what they're afraid about. That's why it undermines, uh, undermines their math learning, right? And Cyan Bylock, for example, has shown, you know, she has a nice book called Choke, um, you know, that it undermines your math learning because it makes you, uh, work, you're thinking, you're spending lots of time thinking about what you're having emotion about. So what are you thinking about? Oh my God, I'm going to look stupid. Oh my God, I'm going to fail, right? That is not thinking about math. That's thinking about something else than math. And no wonder it undermines your ability to do math. What we showed, and these papers are published, you can find them on our website, or you can just look on Google Scholar. Um, the, we looked at um, in, uh, in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, where the schools are very high quality um, and people are very high SES, right? Um, so uh, we looked at kids. This is led by Solange de Nervaux, who's in Geneva. She, she was a Montessori school teacher and uh, before she did her PhD in neuroscience. And what she did is for her PhD is she actually went into traditional schools in Switzerland uh, you know, your typical private public schools where kids were doing their math, right? And they were doing fine. And she also compared them to kids who were in Montessori schools in the same neighborhood. So it's not that we think Montessori is that great, but it is a model of school in which the grades are gone, the process is forefronted, and you're teaching each other about the concepts of the math, not about like, did you get the right answer? Here's the assignment, how fast can you do it? And so what she showed, which is so important, I think, is that First, we, we had the kids, she put the kids in the MRI scanner while they were solving math problems. And these were eight to 12 year old kids in that study. And what she found is that, first of all, the Montessori kids and the traditional school kids got the same number of math problems right. So they had the same level of math, okay, knowledge. They did just as well. But the Montessori kids got far more problems wrong because they didn't skip anything. If they didn't know it, they took a chance and they tried and then they learned from what happened. Whereas the traditional school kids, they got it right the same amount, but if they didn't know, they just skipped it. They got almost nothing wrong, which means that they lost the chance to try and learn because they were nervous to try and get it wrong. Even though we never told them this is a test or you're gonna, anybody's gonna know what you did. They're just dispositionally trained. Don't make any mistakes. Right? And that is not how real mathematicians learn, right? Then in the scanner, what we found, which was really interesting, is that when the kids got, okay, when the kids got a problem right, we gave them a math problem and they got it right. In the Montessori schooling schooled kids, we don't see much happen in their brain when they get it right. In the traditionally schooled kids, when they get it right, you get massive activation in that anterior cingulate, like, oh, yay, right? And then that cingulate starts talking to the hippocampus, which is the remember this, okay? So it's like, oh, yay, okay, memorize that. That answer is this, right? I got it right, remember it. In the Montessori kids, when they get something wrong, you see massive activation in the anterior cingulate, like, oh, what happened? And then you see activation in the parietal lobes, the frontal lobes, it's like, wait a minute, let me figure that out. That's not what I expected, right? <clears throat> and then they are significantly more likely not to get that problem wrong again if they see it later. The traditionally school kids, when they got it wrong, all we see is like their brain active, but we see no organization. It's just like a big freak outfit. 
and they're mm. no more likely to get it right the next time. They get it wrong again the next time because they don't mm. stop to think. They're so, ah, I got it wrong. They're just trying to remember the right answers and freak out when they get the wrong answers, which is not actually an effective way to learn. Mm -hmm. And so across the experiment, the Montessori school kids, like a computer simulation of their style of learning, showed that they were learning more from the, from the experiment. So the way in which we value the outcome is training emotional reactions that are, even with the same amount of math knowledge, dispositionally different ways to place yourself in that context and react and try to learn from it. What we want to think about is how do we help people with anxiety to get back from the right and wrong answer? Just start playing in this space. It's a safe and interesting space to start to play with ideas. It's about the numbers. It's about the ideas. It's not about what's going to happen next, right? And if you can relive that and start to get some confidence in that space that the numbers are actually powerful for helping you to understand things, that's where the anxiety begins replaced with emotion that's equally strong, but that's interest, right? That's drive to keep going. Yes, yes. Very good. Thank you so much for reminding us that um, people, uh, students are not um, anxious or dislike the contents. They probably they they are curious about the contents, but they are taught or educated to be concentrating on the results. What which yes, may frighten right. them or put the limit. Super. Yes, we have right. two questions in the text box. Okay. Um, so can you can you read uh, read sure. the uh, different yeah. uh, situation to the test or video? The war beds, which is an example of affecting tester. Um, trying to see if I understand what that means. Uh, you mean different kinds of protagonists in the story, like some people who are in good situations, some people who are in bad situations, and if they react differently. Okay, so I think uh, so. So yes, we have kids who are doing really well, who do amazing things, who are inspirational. We have other ones who are in compassion-inducing situations and all kinds of things. And what we find is that it doesn't actually matter. The kids bring this disposition to thinking complexly about it. It doesn't matter even if they disagree. They might say, oh, you know, she keeps going to school, even though they shot her and stuff. I wouldn't, I would have just, I would never have that kind of mental strength to keep pushing for what I believe in. I'd probably get scared and go home and just sit and cry. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter because they're at least saying, I'm understanding what it would involve to do that. I'm pushing my brain to think about it, right? Or you say, well, I don't agree that she should have done this. She actually should have done that, or right? If that actually doesn't seem to matter. What matters is, do you bother to think about the bigger picture and yourself and the lesson, or do you just stay with like this thing right here and then I'm done, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that is that seems to be the difference, less than the valence of the emotion. If the, so, I hope I'm mm -hmm. answering the question, interpreting the question right. Uh, are you saying as teachers we should try to connect emotions to learning having, having contents? Um, I think you can't have positive feelings about nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? You need to have content that actually is the impetus for these positive feelings. Or it could be negative feelings. They can be very motivating, right? I'm studying chemistry because... I found out that there's lead in the water in this city in Flint, Michigan, and it's poisoning children and causing brain damage. Wait, really? That's terrible. I need to understand that chemistry, right? It, it doesn't have to be happy to drive learning. You can learn lots of really important things because you're deeply upset about them, right? But the emotion has to be about the content itself, not about like, you know, some superficial thing, like whether you got it right or wrong or something like that. And when you actually engage in thinking about things that are really meaningful, that's where you have actual learning happening. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, um, with the concern of the time, may I um, uh, ask one final question? Yeah. Uh, that um, I think you're such a like good, <laughs> um, speaker like i i fully am fully convinced um 
But on the other hand, I think people may, uh, because uh, this kind of education ideal model may, uh, we, we, need, uh, we can say it's very individualized because everybody may have different emotions or different contextual or uh, cultural background. Um, so implementing that in, in the classroom, um, do you foresee some, so it may be more time, time consuming because everybody's brainstorming, going it's different much directions. It's more time consuming, but in the end, it's more efficient because the kids actually know it, right, when you're done. So the thing is, like sometimes if I have longer talks, I show videos of classrooms, right? And like, look what the teacher's doing, right? Um, and so the, the thing is, it's just a false idea that the most effective way is to just give people the information like squirrels with little nuts and they just eat it. And then that's enough, right? There are times when that will work for very limited things, but the person needs to really understand why they need to know it. So you've got a kid who's like, you know, doing a science project on lead in the dirt and that lead in the dirt, if they're trying to grow potatoes in it and they realize it's gonna poison the people that are growing the garden, right? And then they're like, wait, what's lead in the dirt have to do with it, right? Teacher, can you teach me chemistry? I'm sitting down, like, just tell me about it. How does lead ions work and blah, 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 right? So that they have a need to know and then they can, they don't have to just flail around until they discover the concepts of, of atomic bonding, right? You can sit them down and tell them it, but only when they're ready to hear it. If you sit down and say, now everybody, we're gonna start with atomic bonding and you have no idea why you need to know that, that is where you don't get this kind of deep buy-in and engagement. So it's not that you can't directly lecture to people. It's not that you can't just give them information efficiently sometimes, but they need to be asking you for it. If they don't know why they need to know it, then you've got more work to do before you can engage it. So really what excellent teaching does is you really can't adjust it for every kid in the class. How could you possibly do that, right? That's too much work, it's impossible. But instead what you can do is build out big problems that are richly interesting where kids can come from wherever they come from and set it up so that they are controlling it and working within it. And your job is to give them the resources to notice when it's time to learn about lead atoms, everybody sit down. I think we're all at the point where I'm gonna to explain to you how this bonding works, right? Right. So you are noticing, you're watching, and then you're interjecting and you're steering. You're setting up a world where kids discover for themselves what they need to know. As mm -hmm. compared to, I need to decide for every kid what they need to know and I'm gonna give it to, to them. Which, that's impossible. You can't do that with 30 kids in your class. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Thank you so, so much. Uh, there is a short question. Will more sleep help in the textbook? Yes, definitely. Um, so, and that's not my work, that's other work, but there's very good research. I mean, within reason, right? Like you don't need to sleep, sleep more than, you know, than what you naturally would think at night. It's not like sleeping 24 hours a day. It's going to help you. Um, but, uh, but yes, so the default mode networks are highly metabolically expensive. If you don't have enough sleep, they are not well organized. And you feel frazzled, right? You feel forgetful, you can't think straight, you're grumpy, right? It's all tied to mood and sense of self. So absolutely, that is another thing where we are directly undermining how smart people are by making them sleep deprived. If they are not sleeping regularly with their cell phone off in the dark or whatever, you know, for at least eight hours a night, but for teenagers, sometimes nine and 10 hours a night, they are dumber because of that. Like we literally can show that their IQ goes down because their brain isn't functioning as efficiently. And anybody who's ever been tired knows that you don't think well when you're tired, right? So the thing is, yes, we need to really redesign things that we're actually setting kids up for success, not setting them up to make some, prove something to somebody that somehow they're tougher because they can do it all in the middle of the night. Like that's just silly. Um, that's that's actually not helping them over time to be as smart and as knowledgeable as they could be. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much. Um, we are fortunate that uh, after the post-COVID era, uh, so I guess the internet, <clears throat> the Zoom meeting really helps to um, yeah. <laughs> uh, conquer the distance between us. But we yeah. also hope that we will have the privilege um, to actually invite you to Taiwan to sure in the real context, have a face-to-face -face interaction to listen to more of your research. Uh, 
thank you so so much um but i think it's yeah. dinner time for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's okay all right. It's time for so, you to go out and have a nice walk on the nice morning, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right. Um, and thank everybody for your uh, attendance. So I'll see you online or in person in yeah. the future. Okay, right. perfect. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.